episode 84 of Off Script with Trish Glose, intimate interviews and fun conversations with interesting people. In front of my microphone today, I have Jake Almaris. Almaris? Yes. Okay. Owner of Kaleidoscope Pizza. That's how a lot of people know you here, right? <laughs> I'm one of the owners, yes. One of the owners. Um, you're kind of the head honcho, though. Let's be real. Yeah, I'm still the general manager. Okay, right. right. People report to you. Mm, well, that's a general truth, okay. but... Uh, among the owners, it's a little more complex. Okay, cool. Good. That's good. Um, you said your name is pronounced Almaris, but your son would pronounce it differently. Almaris, right. Almaris. What is your last name? Where does it come from? Uh, it's actually a Germanization of a Spanish name, Almarez. Oh, all right. Is that your family? Are they German? Yes. My grandfather on my father's side immigrated from Germany in the mid-1880s. Wow. Homesteaded in North Dakota. Of course, of course. It's like you uh, make that trek across the country and you're like, this looks good. Yeah. Let's just set up camp right here. Um, we'll get to that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Where are you from originally, Jake? New Rockford, North Dakota. North Dakota. So that's your family settled there. and Yes, my grandfather homesteaded mm -hmm. about 10 miles west of New Rockford. Okay. And grandma? Uh, well, his wife right. was also from Germany. Okay. And Both immigrants? Yes. Okay. My mother's parents were uh, were not immigrants. Okay. Born here. Yeah. Okay. Well, her mother was born in Canada, but yeah. Okay. So they have basically, your uh, how many generations is that? Just two, gener three generations? Yes. My okay. father was the first generation mm -hmm. born in the United States. All right. In North Dakota? Yes. Okay. So you grew up in North Dakota? Yes. Wow. For your whole, like, until you were 18? Uh, I actually went away to high school in the Twin Cities when I was a sophomore. Okay. Um, why is that? I needed to. Uh, I My dream was to go to Notre Dame. Aww. And I, I went to a, a prep school. Okay. Uh, I went to the prep school, but I didn't get into Notre Dame. Oh, man. <laughs> That's okay. Did you grow up with siblings? Yes, one sister. Oh, okay. Older, younger? Older. Older sister. Uh, what was it like growing up in North Dakota? Wow. Uh, well, it was, of course, a different time. Sure. What, well, what what's the year? What are we talking? Well, I was born in 1947, okay. so I grew up in the starting in the mid 50s. Yep. And it was a small town. Mm -hmm. uh, back in those days, small towns and small farms were still uh, what was happening in in North Dakota. A big deal, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, very very insular and integrated. Uh, population there, mm -hmm. uh, very close, uh, uh, but it was, not but, but it, uh, central North Dakota is, you know, has a has a pretty remarkable climate in the wintertime. Remarkable meaning Harsh. incredibly cold. Harsh. It, yeah. yeah. I, I, when I went away to uh, uh, boarding school as a sophomore in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. which is not noted as being the, the you know, the tropical climate. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was balmy. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like, whew, I'm sweating <laughs> under this coat. It got above freezing. Wow, what's this? That's crazy. Yeah. Isn't that funny how your body just acclimates to mm -hmm. different conditions and, and different temperatures? Um, so, yeah, winters are super harsh. Was there, did your family farm? Is that what your dad did? My dad was a businessman. Okay. Uh, he, uh, he, he owned a ranch mm -hmm. uh, that was about 20 miles from town. We didn't live there, gotcha. But uh, that's where uh, I spent a lot of time working when I was mm -hmm. growing up. Uh, like beef cows, dairy cows. We ranched. Uh, we had about three hundred head of, of cattle, mm -hmm. uh, and we also farmed about a thousand acres and had quite a bit of what we call hayland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, farming then and farming now, two completely different things. Yeah, back when I was growing up. All the farms were family farms, and of course that's changed right. dramatically everywhere in the Midwest. But in fact, the last statistic I heard is a pretty old one that the average farm size in North Dakota is now 3,500 acres. Wow, wow! So uh, my family from South Carolina, we farmed too, um, tobacco, some cotton, and the farms then again small and manageable mm -hmm. enough for your family and then if you had another family that shared it with you everybody sort of kept up with it but that just doesn't exist anymore 
and everybody worked. Yeah, everyone. I mean, I mean if you were 10 years old, mm -hmm. you were working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the time my brother and I came along, we did not work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they tried to get us to. Um, I think when we brought in the corn, like corn was a big deal. It was mm -hmm. kind of more of a, a celebration because everybody was, you know, bringing it in and putting it away for the winter. And mm -hmm. so we were kind of forced to do that. And more so because I think my grandma wanted me to see what it took. See mm -hmm. the process. This is where your food comes from. You don't just go to the store and buy a can of this. This is where it comes from in this house. So very important lessons. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we're not we're not really teaching that anymore. Not in the same way. Yeah. You know, we will probably talk about this later. But you know, to see the 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 young people that we bring into Kaleidoscope, mm -hmm. many of whom are having their first job mm -hmm. with us. It's it's. Okay. It's quite remarkable. We'll talk about that. So you go away to Twin Cities yes. as a sophomore. Right. Because you want to go to Notre Dame. Yes. Why Notre Dame? Oh, it was just a dream of mm -hmm. mine. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic household. Right. And, and I was going to ask. Dame, Notre Dame was, you know, mm -hmm. the holy grail of undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still considered, I think, I mean, it's a very prized school. It's, yes. It, one of the top schools in the country, you know, if you're, everybody's seen the movie Rudy. I mean, it just, it, it's just, it has this idea around it, right? Yes. Anybody else in your An family aura. go? Uh, yes. Well, my sister uh, didn't go. She, my sister ended up graduating from the University of North Dakota. Okay. It's a good school. Absolutely. So you go to this, was it considered a boarding school or a oh, prep yeah. school? No, it okay. was, well, it was both. It okay. was, uh, it was St. Thomas Academy. Mm-hmm. And back then it was called St. Thomas Military Academy. Oh boy. Yeah, so it was, it had a military format, especially if you were a resident student, which I was. So did you go specifically to prep to try and get into Notre Dame or was it more, were you a bad kid and you had to go no, to boarding school? No, I mean, school? you know, I certainly wasn't an angel, but uh, <laughs> no, it was it was my decision. Okay. Because, because uh, I, I think I, at that time understood that there was something more than mm -hmm. than what I was seeing in mm -hmm. Rockford. And the parochial school there, which I was going to at the time, was really on its last legs. And, you know, it was, the, the faculty was mm -hmm. challenging. Right. Well, small town, right? Right. So schools, you know, elementary, high schools, in these small towns, they do struggle more so than schools in bigger cities, just resources and I'm sure, you know, it's rural areas, and so you don't have high enrollment, but they do struggle. The public school in New Rockford, at least in those days, was really, I think, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, a lot of my friends who who, grad, who graduated from Central High in New Rockford and went on to school, a lot of them in North Dakota, mm -hmm. you know, were very successful. Awesome. That's great. So you apply to Notre Dame when? Like your senior year, junior yes. year? Okay. Senior year. And you get that letter that says, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> was that heartbreaking? I was very disappointed. But, I bet. you know, they're, that's a really busy time in, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's life when you're uh, getting ready to graduate from high school. So, What were you like in high school? Uh, I guess at this academy, what were you like? Well, at, at St. Thomas Academy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, first of all, tried to be a survivor. You know, to to you know avoid a lot of the problems that I saw with some of the other kids who were there with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to attain leadership positions mm -hmm. because I saw that being in a leadership position was, in some ways, uh, a better way to go than you know being yeah. behind the eight ball, so right. to speak. So, were some of the kids that you were at this academy with were they there because they were bad kids? You know, I don't want to say that that's true, mm -hmm. but I, uh, uh, and I really can't, as sitting here thinking about a, something that happened a long time ago, but I really can't put my finger on someone and say, yeah, that person was, was really a problem. But I think a lot of the kids who went there, uh, went there to uh, upgrade themselves, Okay. you know, to be, mm -hmm. to have the what they thought was the military discipline and and uh was it a legit a military academy where oh yeah okay so yeah. like comparable to 
a West Point type oh, thing? No, it, it wasn't that intense. Okay, uh, but on the same, I'm just trying to kind of visualize what this looks like. Like you're you're up at a certain time every morning. Yep. You've got like a boot camp type thing. Well, not boot camp so much, although when I arrived uh, as a sophomore, mm -hmm. there was a bit of hazing that happened to all incoming cadets. Yikes. Uh, and that continued, you know, that was still part of the, the dorm life for resident students, mm -hmm. but it wasn't particularly oppressive. High structure, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so a lot of structure, more so than any other high school that you oh, would attend. Oh, absolutely. Okay. It was, it was much sense. different for, we called ourselves boarders, mm -hmm. uh, than it was for the day students. Okay. Because well, all they had to do was put on their uniforms, show up for school, mm -hmm. and then when school was out, they they went home. Right. Okay. So you get this letter from Notre Dame says, eh, yeah. <laughs> so bad. Um, what comes next then for you? Well, I, uh, I decided to go to St. Thomas College, which at that time was on the same campus, mm -hmm. which I did. I went home for the summer and then came back and started at St. Thomas College. What did you major in? Uh, business administration. Okay. Is this what you want to do when you grow up? You want to be a business guy like, like dad? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I, as I look back on it, I don't think I had this, this passion that I wanted to, you know, for a specific type of business, but I thought that's, that was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, something that fit me mm -hmm. as much as you can make that determination when you're, a, you know, at that point in your life. I've had so many conversations about that where it's, to me, it's very unfair for an 18 year old to go, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Right. Some of us just know. We just know what we want, and that's the path we go down. But I just think it's incredibly fair to put all that pressure on an 18-year-old. You haven't experienced the world. One of the things that I, what you say is very true. Mm -hmm. And one of the, if I was going to have a regret, it would be that I graduated from high school, went home for the summer, and then came back and started school on the same campus that I went to high school in. In yeah. fact, when I was a freshman, I lived in the same dorm, different floor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would have been, in retro retrospect, a much better idea for me to maybe go work for a year, yeah. you know, just to have some separation. So that Absolutely. Just, I, yeah, so you're not going back to the same place that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think about that often, regrets, and you look back and you're, I try not to go, oh, I really regret that decision. I try to ins instead say, I wish, I wish I would have done this instead. Yeah, I mean, kind and I thing. can't complain about how things turned out, but. No, he, he did pretty good. I have You're a, doing pretty good. <laughs> I have a grandson who, who is an honor student in high school, and mm -hmm. he, he just finished his first quarter at, in undergrad, and he's going to take the rest of the year off. He's going to work. Awesome. And I, yeah, and I mean, you know, at first there's this horror in the family about, my God, what's he doing? And, mm -hmm. and as I thought about it, in fact, that's what prompted me to make the observation that I made a few years ago. I think it's incredibly wise. Mm -hmm. Smart kid, good mm -hmm. student, mm -hmm. all the right values. Mm -hmm. So he'll be fine. Yeah, I think, but you probably, there's that gut reaction of like, oh my gosh, you're going to what? Yeah. Uh, especially for those 18 year olds. Yeah, I'm not gonna go to school right away. I'm gonna go, we think of it as like, I'm gonna go play for a couple of years and work or whatever. But I mean, that's just, I think that's a smart move, especially if you don't know what you're gonna do. Why go to a, a school and spend all of this money um, right. and be in debt and not really know what you wanna do with your life? Amen to that. Yeah. I hope he does play a little. Right. You're what, 18? You're supposed yeah. 17, 18? You should play. Yeah. Now's the time to do it. Um, be, absolutely. Be poor, be broke, and, and go to <laughs> he work. He will and, be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Go to work and, and make some money and, and then just, yeah, fart around a little bit. So, business management. Business administration. Administration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you graduate, I'm I assuming. Did. Um, and then what comes next for you? Well, I was in the Twin Cities mm -hmm. and I got a job with a company called Butler Manufacturing and one of their divisions was at that time manufacturing over the road tank trailers mm -hmm. like for example a milk trailer a bulk milk trailer okay or a bulk cement trailer 
and I, I worked for Butler for a couple of years, uh, and then I had an op. The company wanted to send me to uh, grad school, mm-hmm. and I looked at the uh, entrance requirements, and one of them was calculus. Oh, <laughs> and that that was an absolute non-starter. Mm-hmm. So it, on a whim, I took the law school admissions test, and did pretty well, and that ended up, or the, I ended up going to law school. Law school. Wow, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> my stepdad makes fun of me all the time. I took pre-calculus in high school. I didn't need it. I just was, it was one of those things where I'm like, I'm just going to take pre-calculus. It'll help me in college. I won't have to take the dummy math classes, like right. algebra, whatever. Um, I struggled through pre calculus And he goes, you're going, you're going to be a journalism major. Why are you taking pre-calculus? And I just was weird about it, whatever. I didn't do well in the class. I did pass, but I ended up, I had to take the dummy math classes in college anyways. Right. So it was a total waste. But there's, well, a, there's some not. of that. It's like pre-calculus and you're an English major. What are you doing? It's so dumb. Um, so you end up going to law school where? I went to law school at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska. So where did this whim come from of taking it was a was it a law what I'm sorry you said a bar exam or Well there's a it's called the law school admissions test the LSAT. admissions test my okay And you know I I had a I took a class when I was as part of my business courses at St. Thomas mm-hmm. I th- I'm not sure if I was a junior or a senior but it was business law and I really enjoyed it mm-hmm. and uh I think th- that's what gave me the spark to sure. to at least look in that direction. Okay. So what was law school like? It was intense, but oh. it was really fun. I really? Know. Oh yeah. It was it was for a kid from North Dakota who had, mm-hmm. you know, gone to a Saint Thomas Academy and Saint Thomas College and then bang I was we were. I was married. Mm-hmm. We were living in Omaha and and uh it was it was like getting introduced to a world that I didn't see when I was going to undergrad. Hmm, that's really neat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, law school's what, like three years? Yeah, I did it in two and a half, but Look yes. Look at you. Nice. I, I just, I went to summer school for okay. a couple of summers, so. Got it. And then you take the bar? I did. Pass? Yes. First time? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, some, I... <laughs> some don't pass it the first time. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's hard. It is. Not that I it would is. know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you passed the the first time and then now you're a lawyer? Well, yeah, there was a, there was a stop along the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, after I graduated from law school, I had, uh, attained a position with the Minnesota Supreme Court as a law clerk Mm. and I was a mid-year graduate and it was just kind of unique that one of the justices, uh, his law clerk was leaving at, you know, mid-semester and so and I was able to get the job, and so I worked there for a year and a half in St. Paul mm-hmm. uh, before moving to Alaska. Okay, so here's, this is what I, I, I know a little bit about you, but this is where the Alaska part comes in. So you moved to Alaska, why? Oh, uh, well, first of all, uh, that was at the, the height of the pipeline boom. Mm. And so the state was awash in money. And so uh, there were a lot of opportunities uh, in the law field. I mean, I went in Alaska. Up, oh, and in Anchorage, in I went Anchorage. up there on a uh, for an interview trip, and I, you know, just had more interviews than than I could handle. Mm-hmm. So, it, so it was opportunity, but it was also or professional opportunity, but it was also Alaska was crazy. Yeah. I mean, it was young people. It was robust. I mean. Uh, it, it was not only young people, but it was a young state, uh, a developing place, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just exploding. What year was this? 75, 75. 1975. So Alaska was, ex- Anchorage was exploding. Yes. Well, the whole state was exploding, but mm-hmm. Anchorage is where I ended up. I, I've interviewed someone else who lived in Alaska for a brief time, and he said the one word he would describe about Alaska is big. It's just a big state, big weather, big people, big trucks, big, just a lot of, just like a lot of big things are happening Mm -hmm. in Alaska. That's, that's a, that's an apt description. Okay. 
So when and when you say booming, this is just it's sort of a lot of people are moving into the state. Yes, there were a lot of people moving into the state, and there was a lot of money getting spent in the state, which of course, which is why a lot of people were moving there because yes, there's opportunity. I mean, a huge amount of construction. Mm -hmm. I mean, roads, buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's what I did when I started practicing law. There was so much construction that that I did construction litigation. Oh, okay. Almost prime, almost exclusively. And the jobs that are being offered in the state at the time, and I, I would say some of it's even true now. The pay and the benefits are incredible. Yes, in fact, you know, had I chosen to, to like go to the, go to work for the attorney general's office, mm -hmm. uh, you know, twenty years and you're, you know, you've got a just a really generous pension with health benefits for life, and you're still mm -hmm. relatively young. Mm -hmm. There's even, I think I've read somewhere that, I believe it's the troopers in the state, you can go and work for a certain amount of time, retire super early, and right. your retirement is incredible, yes. incredible in the, in the good way. So there's just a lot of opportunity still within that state. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't kept up on it as much as I used to, but, you know, there's some real money issues uh, with with the state of Alaska now mm -hmm. that didn't used to be there. Okay. You know, they're making significant cutbacks in the university system and state, the state of Alaska pretty much funds uh, education, even, mm -hmm. you know, elementary and high school education. And, you know, there are cutbacks there and there's cutbacks in virtually every, every phase of state services. Okay. So how long are you in Anchorage for then? 26 years. Whoa, Jake. Fif 52 winters. <laughs> 52 winters. I just got that. Sorry. I'm not a math major, as I've already explained. Um, Anchorage is where in the state? Well, Anchorage is in south central Alaska. Okay. It's, uh, it's in the same time zone as Hawaii. It's that far west. Right. Oh, when you look at a map, I always think Alaska is just sort of right you know right by washington no it's yeah. it's really far away and it blows my mind that it's still part of the united states of america yeah yeah no <laughs> well no it, it and it blew our minds too i mean uh when you think that if you're living in anchorage mm -hmm. and you want to go to a major city in the united states which we call the lower 48 right it was three hours and 15 minutes to seattle wow that's crazy. And you're there, you moved there with uh, your first wife? Yes, Veronica. And you have ki you had kids there? Yes, we okay. had two. Okay. So one of them is Ben, who works with us, at, or is one of the owners one of, of the Kaleidoscope. One of the owners of Kaleidoscope, um, who I've met. Um, and you guys live in Anchorage for 26 years, 50, yes. 52 winters. Right. So it doesn't ever warm up? Well. Because there's parts of Alaska that have summer. Right. Actually, if you go north to Fairbanks, mm -hmm. which has a a challenging winter climate, mm -hmm. but in the summertime, the, the 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 climate in Fairbanks it can be in the 90s. Wow. So, but Anchorage was a was on the ocean, and so it was it was moderated by the you know the ocean, mm -hmm. and so the summers were cool, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the winters were were erratic. You know, you could have 10 below zero, then you could have snow, and then it could be 45, and all the snow would turn to ice. Oh, man. Yeah, it was. It sounds like, I mean, you were there for 26 years, so you were enjoying yourself. Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if living in Alaska, at least my approach to it, was if you're going to live in Anchorage, you really have to fight back. You know, it's easy, especially in the winter, to sort of hunker in and because mm -hmm. it's so dark for so long. Mm -hmm. So what we did is is we were runners and, and Nordic skiers. So we made a, a real effort to get out of the house. And, That's how you and, fought back. Yes. Okay. Um, how much darkness are we talking? Uh, in the winter time, mm -hmm. uh, of course, remember the sun, even at high noon, mm -hmm. is really low in the sky in the south. So uh, it would, I think, five hours was the official shortest day of the year. Of daylight. Yeah, like 10 to 3. You'd go to work in the dark and drive home in the dark. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like <clears throat> how it is now yeah. for some people. Um, 
I kind of lost my train of thought there. What is the shortest day? When is the shortest day of the year? When uh, does it fall? Uh, December 22nd. Oh, winter Same. solstice? Yep. Okay. That's my birth. The 21st is my birthday, the winter solstice. So oh. <laughs> I, I'm very I'm very particular about winter solstices. I think they're very special days because that's when I was born. <laughs> um, so uh, does that take some getting used to for you guys? Yeah. In, in fact, uh, in a lot of ways, the summers were as challenging as the winters mm -hmm. because in the summer it never got dark it never gets dark do you no. have to fight back in the summer too a little bit well uh one of the ways that a lot of new arrivals fought back was they they'd line their bedroom windows with aluminum foil classy <laughs> yeah. did you guys do that i don't remember i'm <laughs> sure we we did something but i don't think we went to that extreme okay um or i mean there's also blackout curtains right. too, which I'm sure probably help. But I just, I can't wrap my head around the fact that you have all this daylight and then you have all of this darkness, but I'm sure after 26 years, was it just something, I mean, you're expecting it? Are you getting used to it? Well, I think this is my own observation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I think Alaska is a young person's state. Uh, and I think as you get older, uh, the winter darkness is more challenging. Sure. Uh, and maybe it's just a little hard to kick yourself out the door to, you know, take a jog in the dark right. or go Nordic skiing in the dark. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, excuse me, and just being so far from the rest of the United States is, I think that was one of the main reasons that yeah. that we were... I think, ready to move when we decided to move. There's probably a little bit of like you're missing out on something. Yeah. A little FOMO action <laughs> happening. When we moved, we moved from Anchorage directly to Medford, but <clears throat> we stopped in Seattle on the way down. We flew to Seattle and picked up a car. Okay. And that was the first car that I had owned in the since I had left uh, the lower 48 in 1975. The first car I had owned in the lower 48. Oh, crazy. Because you had a car in Alaska. I'm yeah, you'd, but you'd yeah. fly, you know, you'd sure. fly, and then you'd rent a car. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So you, um, let's talk, let's get back to Anchorage, though, a little bit. What are you doing while you're there? I was practicing law. The whole time? Yes. Okay. Um, obviously, really good job for you. And what kind of law was this? It, it varied a little bit throughout my career, but mm -hmm. uh, it, the cornerstone was always litigation. Litigation. Civil litigation. Mm -hmm. I did some criminal work, but some would describe my work as criminal, but in another sense, I mean, I, I just didn't handle many criminal cases. So civil litigation, meaning what kind of cases? What was, what was one that sticks out for you? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, of course, there were a lot of personal injury cases. Okay. Uh, like lot, injured on the job type stuff? Mm, not so much that. Workers comp is kind of a specialty. Yes, okay. But, you know, the classic uh, would be, you know, you're rear-ended. Oh. Did you have a commercial? No. Oh, Back it. in those days, uh, commercials were just, when I left, they were just starting to come into okay. to vogue. The Bar Association was really uh, mm. hard to convince that that was okay. It I wasn't mean, professional. You could have been in a really classy, you know, um, injured in an accident called Jake. You know, if you yeah. don't, right? Like one of those? Right. But those that were... wasn't my style, but yeah. <laughs> that probably, that seems fitting. Not Definitely not your style. But your personal injury, so people involved in some sort of accident and they're looking to kind of get cash from this accident or? You, usually, and, and you know, I did... I always had some personal injury, plaintiff's personal injury, mm -hmm. uh, in my you know in my caseload, uh, but not too much of it was from automobile work. Oh, okay. Just there were some, of course, but uh, and usually when you're in a personal injury case representing the plaintiff, the injured person, uh, there's usually an insurance company on the other side, mm. because if there isn't an insurance company on the other side. It's really tough to, to even take those cases because, you know, you can, you can just litigate the hell out of them right. and do a really great job and not collect anything. Exactly. <laughs> so 
was it because insurance agencies are not wanting to pay their 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 person because of some sort of issue or that was some of it uh it was insurance companies mm -hmm. i mean you know state farm is an example right but just one example but getting them to pay yeah in many 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 cases you know the, you wouldn't even the case wouldn't even get to a lawyer because they would you know settle yeah adjust okay. it and settle right. it okay and then the vast majority of cases that do get to an attorney settle before trial okay and lots of times you know to be fair to the insurance companies mm -hmm. lots of times it was just a matter of putting the case together so that everyone understood what happened and what the extent of the injuries were uh, in some cases uh, the uh, the insurance company for whatever reason I think made some bad decisions about the position that they would want to take on the case mm -hmm. But even in those cases, usually uh, before the, uh, the trial started, it would settle. Okay. Did you find that there were insurance agencies that were incredibly unfair, specific ones? No. Uh, insurance companies, no. I, companies? Uh, uh, no. Okay. Short answer. Okay. But it was just, as you were saying, you're obviously looking to get um, the most fair deal for your client. Right. Okay. And they're obviously protecting themselves as a company. So right. you have those two sides. And there were some situations like, for example, uh, one of my partners uh, was involved in a, in a products liability case against General Motors. Mm -hmm. And uh, General Motors at that time had a policy mm -hmm. that they would not settle personal or uh, products liability cases. Okay. And so, and everybody knew that. So if you took a personal or products liability case against General Motors, you knew that you were going to have to go to trial and win before you could collect. Mm. And so that, of course, discourages a lot of people from even yeah, trying it. Right. Yeah. Why well, you just say forget but about it? That's an exception. Uh, okay. And you were you represented. No, one of my partners did. Gotcha. I mean, I had a very peripheral involvement in that case, very peripheral. Okay. Did you work for a firm? I did. Okay. Uh, what was the firm? Well, it, I, I worked for several firms hmm. in my, uh, you know, in my 26 years. The last firm I worked for was a firm called Hoagie and Leakish, which I think was seven lawyers. Hmm. Fantastic group of people. Awesome. And that's, you said that was one of the ones you worked at the longest or? Yeah, I think okay. so. Okay. I think it was seven years. So why, well, you kind of answered this a little bit, but you decide to take, the family decides we're moving back to the lower 48. Correct. Okay. Um, was it just because you'd had enough? Yeah. Are you close to retirement at this point? That depends on how you define retirement. <laughs> okay. Well, how do you re uh, define retirement? Uh, define that would be where I would have absolutely no no obligations as mm -hmm. an employer, as a manager. Where I the only thing I I would have none of those responsibilities. Okay. So technically, I'm not re retired. No. But as far as having a you know 40 or 50 hour schedule for work, you know that's not. That's happening anymore exactly was that and that's how it was in anchorage uh well in, in anchorage no i mean in Anch if, if i understand your question correctly i mean i as a lawyer you don't keep hours you just do the job but if you want to make any money <laughs> you have to work a lot right right <laughs> because you have to bill those hours right exactly so it really just i completely understand what you're saying it doesn't really matter 40 hours a week Maybe some weeks you are working 40, some weeks you're working 80, but it just right. doesn't it right. just doesn't matter. Right. Okay. So are you ready for a slower pace then? Uh, when we moved to Alaska or from Alaska to Medford, mm -hmm. it wasn't really a slower pace. It was just a different pace. Different pace. How old are you when you're leaving Anchorage? Uh, 54. 54. So, but you are looking to no longer practice law? Correct. Although at that time, I still had... Uh, a a caseload. It was. It, I wasn't taking any new cases, so a lot of the smaller cases were falling out. But I had two very large mm -hmm. environmental cases that uh, that actually I, I ended up turning over to another uh, law firm 
five years after we moved here just okay. because it was you know we were really involved with kaleidoscope and i i just didn't have the time to devote to that ca those cases what were they well uh probably the most interesting of the two mm -hmm. was a oil refinery that had been built during world war ii mm. in whitehorse and it had been built on a rush rush basis to provide gasoline and oil uh, for the war effort right and after when the war ended the refinery became unnecessary and so it was it was shut down but it was shut down like they do in 1945 mm. <laughs> anyway it right it later turned out that it was a mess my client who was a fuel distributor bought that property along with because there was a fuel distribution mm -hmm. operation on that property anyway it turned out that after my client bought the property it was discovered that there was you know some really significant hydrocarbon contamination in the soil mm -hmm. and so it was a long fight with the people who sold the property to my client as to who was responsible for, for that cleanup yeah okay cleanup of something like that can run what millions oh yeah okay I mean even the environmental what I call it the studies that were done by all of the experts mm -hmm. to ascertain the extent of the contamination mm -hmm. and what caused it you know that alone was in the millions and this is the you said white horse um, so this is part of if I remember correctly was there a base there too uh, during World War II? There probably was, but it was because uh, there were bases everywhere. But, right. But Whitehorse, you know, is, is uh, in the Yukon Territory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's at pretty close to the headwaters of the Yukon River, and that was where, you know, in the, in the earlier days there was mm -hmm. a lot of gold rush activity. Right, because now I believe there are efforts to preserve parts of that because it's somewhat historic because of the war. Uh, that could be, but that wasn't something that I was aware of right. for White Horse. It was just in the news recently. I okay. think they, they were doing, there was a celebration there of, of some sort on, on this property. Um, but that's a, a huge case, and you had to turn that over, obviously, because there's, there's a ton of work in that. Do you know the outcome? Uh, they were settled. Okay. Um, which was, you know, kind of a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took years, literally, to to have all of the in, in involved governmental entities in Canada to agree to what the fix was right. and then to, of course, allocate the who was going to pay for what. Okay. So you take this on and, I mean, do you, in the very beginning, do you see, like, this is, this is huge? This is a big case? Or does it grow? Does it oh, get bigger? No, I mean, we okay. knew it was a, it was a large case mm -hmm. because the, you know, the, the stakes were really high because it was a it was right on the Yukon right. River, right. meaning that the oil was seeping into the Yukon River, and that was a serious problem. That's a no no. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of environmental issues in Alaska. <sighs> yeah, uh, I think that's a fair statement, yeah. but a lot of them uh, were. I mean, there's the usual environmental issues, but. Uh, arising from people who like do gas stations where mm -hmm. they didn't you know where they didn't take care of their underground tanks but the biggies mm -hmm. are involved new development uh, one of the the huge 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 controversies in Alaska now is is the Pebblestone mine which is a massive prospected mining operation huge open pits mm -hmm. uh, that is right in the headwaters of the Bristol Bay drainage where all the red salmon Oh man! I mean, you know, there's the there's over 30 million red salmon that migrate into that area every year to spawn, and you know, there so there are a lot of people who don't want the mining to be there to to endanger not. the salmon, right. and then there's the people who favor development, and they say, well, it's okay, nothing will happen. Right. It's like it's same fight, different state. Yep, absolutely. Right? I mean, we see that here in Oregon when it comes to salmon and enough water and Right. And then the ranchers say we need water too, and the tribes say we need water too. And so there's same fight, just yes. different, place, different place. Although in Alaska, I mean, it, if it wasn't for the mineral development, I think there's pretty much agreement that 
among whether it's the Alaska natives or the non-native commercial fishermen that, mm -hmm. you know, it's a huge bounty, mm -hmm. huge bounty. I mean, yeah, one of the major industries in Alaska when Fishing. you get past oil. Right. Yeah. So when you guys moved there, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. Was there the feeling in Alaska, and I know you weren't everywhere, but in Anchorage at least, is there any sort of controversy or I don't even want to call it a, a rift between the natives and people who are moving in from other places, the lower 48? Is there any sort of headbutting happening? Yeah. I, and I can't speak to this as an expert, but Alaska has, rural Alaska, we mm -hmm. call it the bush, has changed so much. The bush? Yeah. Okay. That's what we, uh, the areas in Alaska that weren't accessible by road or train, mm -hmm. which is most of Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I mean, think about it, that before, you know, we came there in great numbers, all of these native communities uh, were living in Alaska, living on fishing and, and, and subsistence. Mm -hmm. and, and then as we came with our TV sets and all the other things, there was more of a, there was more of a, I don't want to say a clash, but a, a collision between, you know, the 20th century Anglo culture mm -hmm. and the Alaska Native culture. Mm -hmm. And so that had a lot of, a lot of ramifications. Well, especially because you have people moving in who are um, highly successful and mm -hmm. making a lot of money. Right. And buying up property and building a big house and purchasing things. And then you have these other rural towns that, that just, they're still, they're still in that, that, that space. It's a huge problem because as the people in, in the bush, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, learn more and more about the, the world outside, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, think about it. If yeah. you're living in a, in, in a new Lukvik, which is, you know, out in the Arctic, and it's cold and it's snowy and it's dark. And so you turn on your television set and you see a golf tournament with all these lush green fairways and people walking around in shorts and sunshine. Yeah, it's but there's I mean, Trish, there's a lot of things. Uh one of the one of the most common uh clashes, if you will, between uh the natives and non natives mm -hmm. was subsistence because the natives wanted to continue to have priority to harvest the available caribou, moose, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And as more and more non-natives came to Alaska, they want to go out and hunt moose and hunt caribou. Mm -hmm. And if there's a limited supply of, of uh, the available game populations, mm -hmm. What do you do? Right. And, and so that was a that was a huge dispute. And I completely understand. I would be thinking we were here first. Yes. This is our this is our land. You're just a visitor. That's right. That's yeah, right. Makes sense to me. And there's a lot of other things. I mean, the the when the oil came to Alaska, or when when Alaska uh, started developing the 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 oil and on a large scale, mm -hmm. a lot of the the land affected was land that was owned by the or claimed by the Alaska natives mm -hmm. and so they had this this massive settlement it was it was a actually an act of congress called the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act which it was very complex but it it allocated uh, a certain percentage of the the oil revenues to the Alaska natives, and they were organized into regional mm -hmm. and and village corporations. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I it I'm not sure I could adequately describe it if I had another hour. Wow! But it, but it was very complex. Okay. But it did serve to give the Alaska Native community uh, some involvement mm -hmm. in in the the wealth of Alaska and, and some of these native corporations, you know, really went a long ways to develop their own drilling companies and their own fuel supply companies and other things. So they were actually participating 
in the growth in the Alaska economy. Which helps. Oh, yeah. yeah. That helps, and that helps ease those tensions, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. It was say. actually kind of an interesting concept. Right. Of course, it, it, well, I, you know, it's hard for me to say, but I, I think it is fair to say that, that there are, were a lot of shortcomings, and maybe it's because there's really no way to adequately resolve the clash between the traditional native light mm -hmm. culture and the Anglo culture. Right. And you see that too in states like Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue there with people moving from the mainland to right. Hawaii. The, the natives aren't huge fans. You see that, I mean, in Oregon where, you know, there's this idea of like people from California, this idea of like, don't move into Oregon. And it's just, I mean, you probably see that in every state. Absolutely. But Anywho, we, it goes back to kindergarten. We need to learn to share the sandbox. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, just share people. Um, okay, we're moving on. So you decide to move to Medford of all places. Had you ever been to Medford before? No. We, we, had, uh, we have some friends from Alaska okay. who had moved to Ashland. Okay, and if I may ask, are you with Veronica still at this no. time? No. Okay. Veronica and I split up in the late 80s, although we're still... So divorced in Anchorage. Yes. Okay, still... S still dear friends. I love it. That's yeah, so, she, so great. Yeah, she, when she and her, her companion, her John, when they come to visit, they recently bought a condo mm -hmm. here, but, uh, but they would always stay with us and... Love it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's been a good... And it's so helpful for the kids. And I'm not saying those people who divorce and don't get along, that's bad. But it just, I like to see when people can still, when you can get along, when you can share in the sandbox. Um, so you guys, you divorce in Anchorage. Does she, so she still lives there? Yes. Okay. Wow. Is she a lifer? Uh, I think she's, well, she's, I won't, she's not a young woman anymore either. <laughs> don't say her age. How dare you, We Jake? were in the same grade. <laughs> But so she's she's gonna hang out in, in Anchorage. Yeah, she loves okay. it. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's she, amazing. So then you meet Christy in in yes. Anchorage. Okay. What Can was I, she doing when you guys met? Christy was working at Nordstrom. Nordstroms. Yeah. I love it. Was one of the first Nordstrom stores outside of the Seattle Portland area. Oh wow. And it just closed. Did it really? Yeah. Was it a big deal when it opened? Yeah, and it okay. was a really a big deal when it closed too. Oh, I bet. You know that was a institution in Anchorage. Right, right. Um, I was going to add, this is, I, I'm so sorry for the randomness, but when you were talking about hunting caribou and moose, did you ever hunt caribou I or didn't, moose? no. Okay. I, I've never hunted anything with fur. Okay. <laughs> did you eat it? Did you ever, have you ever had caribou? I, I, I've had caribou. I don't particularly like caribou, but moose is delicious. Really? Yeah. What would you compare caribou to? It's comparable to what? More like deer. Okay. And then moose is comparable to more like bison mm. or I mean it's it's lean. Very. Moose is very lean. Yeah. And of course a lot of it depends on how the moose is cared for after mm. it's been shot because right. you know it Aren't caribou in the reindeer family? Yes. Okay. They are. They I think they are reindeer essentially. Okay. Yeah. Reindeer is domesticated caribou. Don't tell the kids. Okay. <laughs> Let's not tell the children that, that caribou are being hunted. Here's Rudolph. Yeah, exactly. There's some, um, I just saw a CBS News story about a village. Ooh, it's um, where caribou are becoming extinct. Okay. And they're just, and it's basically because there's not enough snow and that's how they eat. They dig under the right. snow. And so, um, so there's some communities in the world where, you have these villagers who are desperately trying to protect their caribou and their right. reindeer. Right. Because if we don't have reindeer, Santa's sleigh will not fly. <laughs> you you know, you raise a whole, I mean, we, we probably oh, sure. don't have time to talk about what's happening in Alaska with the climate change and some of the, besides the polar bears and all of the things that we, mm -hmm. that are pretty highly publicized mm -hmm. in what you just mentioned, but there are some other really significant uh uh, ramifications. When the permafrost melts and you have houses built on permafrost, 
and the ground becomes soft. Uh oh. Yeah. yeah. So there, it, it, it's. What's permafrost? Well, permafrost is is the the ground mm -hmm. is frozen year round because the the climate is so cold mm -hmm. uh, that that once you get depending on where you're at, but once you get a foot or two below the the surface of the the ground, the, it just doesn't thaw. And now you have foundation issues. Yes. With your house. Yeah. Um, roads. Yeah. Other, uh, as far as roads, meaning like creating sinkholes or there's erosion. Yeah. I mean, if you if you have a road that you built on permafrost mm -hmm. because it had you know for I don't know how many tens of thousands of years it's been right. there. Right. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden it's melting. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. it's. Is most of the state have permafrost? No. Well, okay. I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. I, I can say that there is, you know, Alaska is so vast yeah. that as you get further north, and I don't know where the permafrost line really is, but but it, it's you know huge. I would imagine so. Yeah. I would imagine it being big. Western and northern Alaska. And other issues, too. Um, is there still, because I, you know, you hear in the news that there's a, a shortage of fish. And if we keep fishing, that we're going to, all the fish are going to go away in the ocean. Is there still a good amount? Is there a good bounty, as you said, in Alaska when it comes to? I think that, that again, you know, I don't, I don't speak as an authority on this. Sure. Uh, but uh, my sense is that uh, there are, for example, the king salmon run mm -hmm. in the Yukon River has significantly declined. Mm. I mean, where I am not sure that there's any commercial fisher, fishing of, of the Yukon River salmon, and I think the sports fishing is limited. That's happening on the Kenai Peninsula, which is a huge sports fishing area in south central Alaska. Uh, they're dealing with, you know, the, the state of Alaska spends a lot of money on maintaining and regulation regulation of the of the, the commercial fisheries, mm -hmm. uh, salmon and also halibut and mm -hmm. other offshore species, and so it's an on crab. So it's an ongoing uh, it's an ongoing struggle. But climate change is definitely affecting. The salmon, for sure. Right, right. And not in a good way. Right, and as you said, we could probably talk about it forever. But lots of other, lots of other areas of the environment in mm -hmm. Alaska, because you have the state that depends on cold. Yeah. And as it's warming up, I mean, yeah, things ask, are going to suffer. Ask the polar bears. Right, they're not happy. The whale migration patterns are changing. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's and it's happening so fast that it's it's uh, difficult to. To really stay on top of it, mm -hmm. and I think in a lot of cases people really don't know what to do. And there's, of course, the political of course. differences about how to deal with it. I feel like sometimes too, it's so overwhelming. You know, just as me, this this person that lives in Oregon, I don't know what I can do to help. It, it's just it's it's overwhelming to think yeah. about like climate change and that the world is warming up and. I don't know. It makes my stomach hurt, but at the same time, it's just it's. I try not to. I try not to dwell on it because I do love the planet. You love the planet, obviously, but you just kind of have to fight your battles where you can, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah, we have our own issues here, and at the end of if we you do. ask me your three questions, I have. Yay. We can talk about the smoke. Okay, I promise we're getting there. But you're interesting, Jake. This, I knew this was going to be a longer podcast because okay. you're, you're I'm, interesting. I have nothing to do today. Yay, you're retired today? Well, I'm not working today. Oh, okay. actually, I have to go down to Kaleidoscope and, and get mm -hmm. a check and take it out to the Pebblestone Winery. Okay. So that's... All right. Okay, you just reminded yourself. Speaking of Kaleidoscope, so let's get back to why you decided to move to Medford. You said you had friends who moved to Ashland. That was incidental. Oh, okay. The, the reason <clears throat> that we we ended up in Medford is we wanted to leave Alaska mm -hmm. for the reasons, some of the reasons we've talked about. We didn't want to live in California with all due respect to uh, the people in California. Yeah, I don't want to live in California. I, mean, I just, love the state. I just don't want to live there. We, the concept that we had at the time just wasn't, and we didn't want to live anywhere where there was winter. 
which ruled out anything east of the Cascades, <laughs> including Bend. Right. Okay, and we didn't want to have these long, wet winters, right. so that eliminated Seattle, Portland, Portland, and Eugene. Eugene, yeah. So there, Medford it is. <laughs> Medford it's it actually is. true. Yeah, that's that's really funny. And we do have a little bit of a winter here. Yeah, but as you as we woke up yesterday and there was snow on the ground. Ain't nothing. Nothing. <laughs> You're like this is balmy, yeah. right? <laughs> when we moved here, we moved here in June of '01. Okay. So it was a it was a beautiful summer, but when winter came, mm -hmm. and the grass stayed green, mm -hmm. and the photinia leaves stayed green, uh -huh. I actually felt guilty. Oh. Why am I here? You know, <laughs> this can't be right. That's great. Um, so you, uh, are you and Christy married at this point? Yeah, we got married. Uh, actually, when did get, we, we got married in 94. 94. So you guys come to Medford to specifically open a pizza joint? A pizzeria, yes. A pizzeria. I say pizza joint in the most, in the most lovingly way. Um, why? Well, because, uh, we had, I had in, worked in the restaurant industry when I was going to school mm -hmm. uh, and had always sort of had an affinity for it. Mm -hmm. uh, Christy had some involvement in it, but my son. Uh, this is Ben. Ben okay. was, uh, had been working in pizza restaurants since he was 16. Mm -hmm. And he was working as the kitchen manager of a pizza restaurant in Anchorage called The Moose's Tooth. The Moose's Tooth. And if you read about The Moose's Tooth in the pizza periodicals, mm -hmm. you will see that it's the single, it's the top grossing single store independent pizzeria in the United States. Wow. How does that happen in Alaska? Well, Anchorage is kind of an interesting place. I mean, there's, there's a lot of money in Anchorage, right. at least there was then. Right. Uh, you know, with the oil company cutbacks, it's changed a little bit. But uh, when they opened the Moose's Tooth in the in the mid '90s, I mean, it was crazy. Right. Well, you could say when you opened Kaleidoscope, it was crazy, and it's just I feel like it's gotten crazier. <laughs> the Moose's Tooth has always, and, and and I haven't looked at the numbers recently. Mm -hmm. I know our numbers, but. Uh, probably at least double what we do, and they do it in one store. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So anyway, Ben was there. He had a really good rapport with the owners. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we, there's a, it's kind of a long story about how I got there, but, but uh, anyway, we started thinking about opening a, Moose's Tooth-like restaurant mm -hmm. in the lower 48. And then we did some more research and thinking and thought, you know, well, Medford would really be a cool place to do it because mm -hmm. it would be a nice place to live. And when we did our recon here, with all due respect to the pizza restaurants that were operating mm -hmm. then, and uh, we didn't see anything that was really like the concept that we had in mind, which was a full-service restaurant specializing in gourmet pizza. Mm -hmm. And you could say, I think you could probably say that's still true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have, you know, Wild River is, uh, is I mean, we have more competition in, in, than we did mm -hmm. when we opened, for sure. Right. So, um, and so it's all of you guys. So Ben's included in this project. Ben was an integral part of the mm -hmm. project. In fact, when we were working with... Uh, with the bank that ultimately took a chance on us, mm -hmm. South Valley Bank and Trust at that time, okay. uh, they didn't know anything about the Moose's Tooth. And I had been in Alaska on a business trip, and I so I went into to the Moose's Tooth mid-afternoon on an April day, uh, a weekday. And I was taking all these pictures so that I could show them what the moose's tooth was like. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that they noticed when they were looking at the photos, the pictures, photos, are electronic, Either. anyway. Yeah, pictures. Okay. Uh, was that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh -huh. it was full. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. 
Which is, you could say the same probably about kaleidoscope. Well, not like the moose's tooth. Okay. I, I mean, you know, we still have, you know, some pretty dead time in the day during okay. the middle tell of the me day. what those are and that's when i will go 2 <laughs> okay. 30 2 30 in the afternoon <laughs> yeah, is absolutely. when it's quiet so you guys this is 2001 yes when does kaleidoscope open oh four oh four okay so february of oh four you take some time then to to build this and and make sure it's right yeah that's a good way to put it uh when we came to we had this notion when we first thought about opening a pizzeria in Medford, mm -hmm. that what we could do is what happened with the Moose's Tooth, mm -hmm. that we could find a failed restaurant site and just go in and, you know, rent it, first of all, mm -hmm. not buy it, mm -hmm. and, you know, renovate it to our standards and go from there. And the first thing we discovered was there was nothing like that available. Mm -hmm. And so that changed the, the focus from renting to buying and back in 04 uh you know the, the economy here was pretty robust back then mm -hmm. and it was not easy to find a location sure uh and one of the things that that w i was insisting on was that if we we're going to do this we're going to plan to succeed which means that we have to have uh the potential for a large enough facility to give us the the volume that we needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you find the property. We did. Mm -hmm. Over it's off sixty two. Yes. Okay, um, you're building. It opens. Day one. I'm assuming you had like a soft opening. We had three. Three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we we uh, we had a soft opening. I forget. I think the first one was for the church. Trinity. Okay. And then it was all the people who worked on the building. Hmm. And I can't remember. Maybe it was just two. It was such a blur then. I mean, you know. It was a long time ago, too. Yeah. Let's be real. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Oh. So um, how did the soft openings go? Oh, it was great. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, like any soft opening, there were there were some bumps. But uh, we, we had uh, done a pretty good job I think of of hiring uh, a front of the house staff mm -hmm. and Ben uh, had managed to find enough former Moose's Tooth cooks who are not working at the Moose's Tooth so that we were able to bring them in uh, to kind of provide the backbone for our kitchen mm -hmm. so that we could is the menu at Kaleidoscope somewhat similar to the menu at Moose's Tooth? Yes. Okay. Very much similar? Yeah. I think over the years, you know, it's changed a bit. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, the, 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 the pizzas that we've had on our menu since day one, mm -hmm. I think, are all pizzas that you would find on the Moose's Tooth menu, mm -hmm. some of which had different names. So the Moose's Tooth obviously <clears throat> gave their blessing. Absolutely. To Essentially, this is Moose's Tooth, the Oregon version. Yeah, although we wanted to put our own stamp on it, of course. And, and we had an agreement with them, and of course, one of the agreements was that we were not affiliated with the Moose's mm -hmm. Tooth. We weren't going to use the Moose's Tooth as part of our, mm -hmm. you know, my my mentioning the Moose's Tooth now is more historical than promotional. Very much so. Because back then, uh, you know, we certainly weren't saying that we're a spinoff of the famous Moose's mm -hmm. Tooth in Anchorage. Right, but there was clearly a Yes, go for it. Oh, more than that. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, the first year we were open, uh, one of the owners of the Moose's Tooth, Rod Hancock, came down. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things he told us was, get more high chairs. <laughs> get more high chairs? Yes. Like for children? Yes. Oh, man. That's so funny. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Kaleidoscope, where does that name come from? Christy. Christy came up with that. Yeah, we were, uh, it was actually kind of a long process. Um, I did not want to have a restaurant named with an apostrophe S. I, I just didn't. No? Just didn't work with you? Yeah, I just. Okay. Uh, and so then it was a question of finding a name that was, you know, not. That's not, very specific. Yeah, and Christy just, we were also. 
Christie came up with it. Out of nowhere, just kaleidoscope? Yeah, yeah. and it was, it was kind of the idea that, that okay, it's, it's like a pizza. Yep. And uh, our vision was to have, you know, you can change a kaleidoscope to have lots of different oh. looks. And we, that's what we wanted to, to do with Very kaleidoscope. Smart. Yeah. And Grateful Dead? Is that your influence or Ben's influence? Oh, me. But, but it wasn't, again, that wasn't planned at all. Oh. We were, uh, short version, okay. <laughs> we were going up to Portland to look at light fixtures. Mm -hmm. uh, very early in the constru construction process, well, the design phase, yeah. actually. And we got stuck in a traffic jam in Albany. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to Christy, you know, when we go get to Portland, we ought to look to have something, something in the restaurant for Jerry, Jerry Garcia. Okay. And so later on that trip, we were, we were looking for blown glass light fixtures. Mm. And we wandered into a place in Hawthorne called Smoke and Glass. Fantastic. Only guess what? They didn't have blown light. Oh. <laughs> they had pipes. Pipes. Mm-hmm. So we're walking around and they're looking around and we saw this 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 original watercolor portrait mm -hmm. of Jerry Garcia. Mm -hmm. And so we bought it. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started and people just started bringing stuff in. Really? Yeah. Memorabilia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you a deadhead? Would you consider yourself a deadhead? Well, that might be too strong of a term. Okay. Uh, I like to say that I've been to a few shows. Been to a few shows. Love their music, mm -hmm. but, you know, I didn't follow them around. I was, you know, married mm -hmm. with children. Right. You had to be responsible. I did. Uh, do you know Jeff Shepard, owner of Lily Bell Chocolates, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. Major deadhead. Oh, yes. Major. He is. Um, he used to tie-dye T-shirts and sell them at concerts. Yeah. And that's how we got to the next show. Um, but he also has started, I don't know the, remember the name of it, but these bootleg cassette tapes that mm -hmm. you would record the concert with. Right. He's now, a lot of people have found that they don't, they're cluttering up their attics or whatever. And so he has said, I will be your your shelter for, okay. I will take in all of your bootlegs because the wife is like, you got to get rid of all of these tapes. So he's now taking all of those in. And now people all over the world will say, do you have such and such show from the summer <laughs> of whatever? Me. Okay. And they can, he's giving all of this music a good home, but he'll adopt it out if people want it. It's fantastic. You, you, he may have some shows that you've been to. You don't know. Oh, I'm sure. I have quite a few of them, but. Bootlegs? Yeah. That was kind of the thing with the Grateful Dead, wasn't it? They always let people record their shows. So cool. Yeah. It's really amazing band. So that's where the Grateful Dead side comes in. And did you have, because I have seen the wine list at Kaleidoscope. It's pretty amazing. Is that your influence? Yes. That was one of the things that, that we wanted to do was to separate ourselves from all of the other mm -hmm. pizza restaurants in the area. So it's not just pizza and beer. Yeah. Okay. And one of the things that we, we decided was that we're going to have a wine list that is going to be unmistakable. Mm. And, of course, we also had alcohol, but that's mm -hmm. a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we, we started out with a wine list that had 175 labels on it. Wow. And, of course, over the years, we've, we've you know, reduced that dramatically. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we did, as long as we're on the subject, is yes. we decided uh, – Christy taking the lead, but that uh, we did not want to have any wine on our glass pour menu mm -hmm. that wasn't local. Good for Christy. And so, well, it was a, and so we started doing that, oh gosh, I want to say 08, something like that. Okay. Which, there was a lot of local wine back then, but now. Yeah, yeah, it's. Does that still remain true? Oh, absolutely. We've the only thing we've done is we we made one exception for that on a on a Pinot from the Willamette Valley that you kind of have to that we got on a really special deal and mm -hmm. it was too good to pass up. Mm -hmm. But you kind of have to. So wait, what was the story with the alcohol? Did you guys also want to have a full bar too? Well, we were undecided. Okay. And uh, a mutual friend 
introduced us to a guy who owned a bar on 2nd Avenue, 2nd Street in Portland, a fern bar, Mm -hmm. Patty's. Mm, I've never heard of it. Anyway, he, he, he had been in the bar business forever. And we asked him, you know, should we have alcohol? And and he said, absolutely, because you never want to say no to a customer. Yeah. And so that was what we did. And it's still a, it's still a very insignificant percentage of our of our mm-hmm. revenue. What is it? What is it about the pizza? Or maybe a better question: What is it about Kaleidoscope? Because you can absolutely brag here. Your numbers have, I mean, are amazing. One of the busiest, most successful pizza shops in pizzerias in the country. According to Pizza Today. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. Pizza Today? Yeah, it's one of the trade periodicals. And they do what they call Hot 100. Hot 100? Yeah, it's an annual survey where where, uh, they they pull the the pizza restaurants for Mm -hmm. their annual sales. And by the way, the Moose's Tooth no longer gives them their numbers, so every the ranking is skewed because pizza colitis or uh moose's tooth but anyway in the last one uh, i think we were number four among the wow among the independents in the country that's amazing so what is it is it the location is it the pizza is it the staff well i think it's all of that i mean all of the above yeah and maybe maybe a lot of luck who knows yeah (laughs) But, uh, a lot of business, you know, um, the podcast I had just before you, we were talking about businesses and failing. A lot of businesses fail early, especially restaurants, early on, like within year two or three. You know why? Tell me. Two reasons are related. One is that there are a lot of really gifted chefs, mm-hmm. you know, people who can really get into a kitchen and produce a product. Yep. And so, by God, I've got this great idea and, you know, people are going to love my food. All true. Mm-hmm. But... It's a business, mm. and a lot of people don't know how to run a business. And that's you know, if you do, if you can't run a business, you can't succeed as a business. And it doesn't matter how great your food is, right? You have to have that business side, and you have to be able to survive the lows. Yeah, and then be careful in the highs. Right. I mean, there's so many things that go into it. You know, your your pricing structure. Mm. Uh, just your whole philosophy. There are a lot of businesses, sadly, that that run on the idea that nothing else matters except the bottom line. You know, that's why if you go into some of these stores now, you can't get waited on because they're cutting labor. And, you know, all kinds of things yeah. where you can see where people are just sacrificing quality to make a few more dollars. For and sure. And that's, by the way, never been our philosophy. Well... You're doing something right. I mean, we would rather make less money and stay on top of the quality Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to slipping the other way. But the other reason uh, restaurants fail, and it's well known, is that they're underfinanced. You just have to be able to stay the course and make adjustments as you have to. Yeah, exactly. And I I truly feel, too, it has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. When I walk into kaleidoscope and i order the same i want that pizza that i order to be the same every single time i order it yes. and if it's a little different i'm disappointed yes because i'm giving you money my hard-earned money right and i want that pizza to be good i've been looking forward to it all day right yeah i agree it's my customer rant um no but i think you could definitely say that about kaleidoscope is that very consistent mm-hmm. and now you've just recently opened up a to-go kitchen a completely separate off-site location that's right kind of right next door right um people can call into go orders which right. is brilliant i love that place well we had to do it you had to we were uh we were getting strangled mm-hmm. okay if you're going to go to kaleidoscope on a friday night do you want to wait for two hours for a table no you won't do it right uh and as we were seeing our kitchen get more and more challenged mm-hmm. just with Keeping up, mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of that was to go. Mm-hmm. And so we, when we took the to goes out of that kitchen, we took thirty percent of the pizza production out of that kitchen, and you know, so and added really it. smart. Yeah, whose idea was that? Uh, it was all of our ideas. Good. Uh, it's a good one. Yeah, 
It's a really good one. All right, we're going to wrap up. I feel like we could talk a lot about pizza, though, and Alaska. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and wrap up and get to the final three. Best advice you've ever been given? I thought about that. Okay. Um, and good. I could, I could, how much time do I have? Uh, as long as you want. <laughs> no, I taught, thought about Matthew 23 and, uh, you know, but uh, I think there are two. Okay. Uh, on a personal, well, first the business. Um, uh, there is, excuses are no substitute for performance. That's good. And the other one uh, is we can always make time for the things that we want to do. I just read something the other day that said, please don't tell me you're busy. You can always make time for things that if, need to yeah, get done. I don't have time. Yeah. That's a cop out. Yeah. I mean, usually, I think there, there's probably exceptions to that rule. No, I, I would think, I think you're right. And the first one was don't make excuses, say it, it again. Excuses are no substitute mm -hmm. for performance. That's a good one. I'm yeah. going to use that one in the newsroom. Yeah. I hear a lot of excuses. Yeah. Um, and just as a footnote, the the people that, that the, the employees that have the most difficulty performing are usually the ones who have the most excuses. Mm. Who gave you that advice? Do you remember? I can't remember. Mm. No. That's good. That's really good advice. Do you say it a lot? Yes. <laughs> Work is I'm, inconvenient. That's another one. Oh. One of my favorites is, especially in the newsroom, I always say, if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. Yes, that's that's something that, yeah, that's... That's a good one, too. It's just like, if you're if you're hanging out for 10 minutes and you're not getting your work done, I mean, if you've got 10 minutes, do something with 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you ever left this place, Southern Oregon, what would you miss the most? What would bring you back here? Oh, goodness. Uh, it's kind of a combination of things. I mean, this is really an idyllic place to live with the you know with the beautiful mountains which mm -hmm. coming from Alaska are absolutely critical mm -hmm. I couldn't go back I go pheasant hunting in South Dakota every year and it's flat and it's just I love it but I'm glad yeah. to come the mountains so, keep us safe yeah the mountains and the just the, the 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 environment I mean we have rush minute here okay I can go from where I live in East Medford to downtown Ashland in 15 minutes. Yeah. I can be in Jacksonville in 20 minutes. Yep. It took me 12 minutes to drive from my house to here. Right. So Yeah. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> and of course the people and I and I also think that the the uh the way that the Rogue Valley has changed even since we moved here with with more viticulture Mm -hmm. I th is something that we really enjoy. Yeah. I feel like every day I feel a little luckier yeah. to live here, for yeah. sure. And the culture. I mean, have mm -hmm. you been to that new, uh, uh, the theater across from Tinseltown? Oh, is it? It's not Camelot. It's um, the experimental. It started, yes. I have not been, but I it know what you're talking about. It is amazing. Really? Amazing. Okay. Good uh, to know. You know, I went in there thinking that I was going to see some kind of a halfway amateur. Right. And it was highly professional, highly professional. It was okay. really good. I will put really that on good. my list. Really good. I love that. Final meal, final drink? Well, I mean, how can you not talk about, a you know, a, an Oregon, you know, I think our Tempranillos here are crazy. Crazy good. And I... Uh, even though I love pizza, mm -hmm. I'd probably have a cheeseburger. <laughs> oh, I'm with you on that one. There's something about a cheeseburger, right. right? It's just got all the best elements in it. Comfort food. Okay, cheeseburger in a, in a glass of Tempranillo? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, sounds good. Jake, you've been a lot of fun. Oh, it's been fun. great. I've enjoyed it. Okay, maybe, maybe you'll come back and we'll talk more about other things we didn't touch on. Fine. Okay. I don't want to bore you, but I, it's always fun. I was really nervous to... No, uh, not bored. Not to, bored at to all. To do this. No, really? Oh, yeah, of oh. course. But it's not that bad, right? No. I I'm did. not that bad. Did I go, ah? Uh, no. I didn't. Mm -mm. I was told not to do that. So. Oh, okay. And you also were sitting up pretty straight for the whole thing. You good. mentioned that you your posture may have slouched a little bit. No, you did good. You well, did thank good. You. And thank I want you. you to come back. If you are listening to this podcast on Apple's podcast app, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps other people find us. We're also on Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can find the video version on YouTube and at KTVL.com. Just click on features and then off script one more time. Jake from Kaleidoscope, thank you so much thank for you. being here. Thank you. It's been fun.